Brothers and sisters, I direct your attention to the Epistle of Jude, the penultimate book of the New Testament. And I do so for one very special reason. As we've been reminded recently, if one speaks the truth of the Word of God and of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in such a way as to offend those who deny it, there'll be trouble. Trouble from the police. And the two issues which seem to be most sensitive at the present time are, of course, Islam and homosexuality and all its related perversions. And if any Christian dares to speak against these falsehoods, these perversions, these corruptions, uh, there'll be trouble. And the reason why the epistle of Jude is so uh, useful and so inspiring, so instructive, so reassuring, is that these twin evils were present in the New Testament era. There never has been a, a golden time of trouble-free Christian worship and work and witness. For example, although Islam was still five centuries away from the days of Jude, yet there were, at his time, those who denied the distinct deity and uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have this, for example, referred to uh, in verse 4. Those who deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Islam is not the only ideology that is guilty of this evil, but uh, it is one of many at the present time. And then when it comes to homosexuality and all its related perversions, there were those, even at this time, who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness, moral looseness. And that seems to be the immediate background in which Jude wrote his epistle. Not so much, we might say, wickedness in the world because the world will always do its wicked thing but wickedness within the church you see the problem is that the church is meant to cleanse the world but when the filthy world infects the church the church herself sinks to the level of the world and that's where a great battle is being fought at the present time so Jude has a great deal to say to us, to instruct us and to encourage us. What then are we to do to face these twin evils and several others besides? How are we to face the situation, to face the threat that we face as Christians in these days? Well, that is what Jude is concerned to, to do. And uh, he says this in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So there we're reminded that rather than just roll over and accept the decadence that surrounds us, we are to contend, to declare, to proclaim, to stand up for the truth of God. And when he says we must contend, we are to contend earnestly, not just contend in a quiet manner but to contend earnestly that means with with passion and with conviction and with zeal for God 
So that is what we're commanded to do, to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, a faith which once delivered is not to be amended or tampered with or diluted or challenged but to be contended for. It has been delivered, of course, by Christ himself, delivered to us by him through the apostles. It is delivered to the saints, that is, to Christian believers who are sinners saved by grace. So our marching orders are clear in this spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. We are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And then the prevailing decadence that is the context in which Jude wrote this letter, uh, it covers verses 5 down to 19. There's a clear reference not only to immorality in general, but sodomite and homosexual perversion in particular. Uh, those who have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, and they're set forth as an example who will suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. Yes, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah are particularly specified here. So here we have an example of even within the church, and this has always cropped up in every age, the tendency for the professing church to depart from the faith and to sink to the disgusting levels of a sinful world. And uh, such people often raise up those who will scoff at this holy faith for which we are to contend. So that is the problem that we have to face. It's always to a degree been with us, is even more crucially with us at the present time, as we've seen from uh, local developments uh, in which I personally uh, have been involved. The question, therefore, is how do we handle the situation not only are we to contend, but how are we to contend? To do so in a manner which uh, honours rather than dishonours God, which is consistent with Christian conviction and compassion, in such a manner that uh, will be worthy of the high calling with which we are called. But at the end of this epistle, we're given a quartet of directions in how to contend earnestly for the faith. And they're mentioned in verses 20 and 21, where we read, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now we may narrow those words down to four. We as Christians are to be building. Second, we are to be praying. Third, we are to be keeping. And fourth and last, we are to be looking. Let's just explore these things uh, together. First of all then, building. You, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. That's um, essential because unless we build upon the foundation of the word and revelation of God, uh, we'll be collapsing rather than building. So we are to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. And it's very striking that uh, this faith is referred to as the holy faith because it is a faith which produces holiness in those who believe it who embrace it who desire to witness to it and to, to, to live it out but our foundations must be secure we must build ourselves up 
and how do we build ourselves up in our most holy faith? Well, very basically, we are to be thoroughly based upon the Bible. We are to be familiar with the Scriptures, read the Scriptures constantly, daily, soak in the Scriptures and the message that they contain from Genesis through to Revelation. The message of the patriarchs as well as the message of creation. The message of the prophets. The message of the Psalms. And then coming to the New Testament, the Gospels of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ presenting us the glorious picture of his person and his work and his great salvation that he's brought us and then of course the letters of the New Testament and all that has been revealed to us Jude of course is the last letter of the New Testament so we are to build ourselves up and I believe we may also say that uh, we must be aided not only by the book of God but other books which faithfully expand the book of God and we must be thankful to the Lord for all those who down the centuries have expounded the scriptures and have preached them and whose books have been recorded and written for later generations yes we must be very very thankful for those who preach to us the word of God that's the way to build ourselves up on our most holy faith that's what we must do as as Christians. And every aid which has biblical integrity may be used. For example, the Delta Course, which uh, I devised some time ago, which is bringing considerable blessing to East Africa right now, as some of you are aware through, through my, my reports. So we build ourselves up on our most holy faith, that's the first thing, therefore. What's the second thing? We are to pray in the Holy Spirit. To pray in the Holy Spirit. And that clearly means not just saying our prayers, but uh, praying our prayers in the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit alone who enables us to pray. We need the Holy Spirit to give life to our spirits. We need his life to enable us to pray with life. And of course all this presupposes that there will be a relationship between us as Christians and the Lord Jesus Christ who has saved us. So we must pray in the Holy Spirit. And when Jude uh, thus exhorts us, he's reminding us that uh, we need to depend upon God. We need to depend upon his power and not our own. And a sure sign that we are praying aright in the Holy Spirit is when we pray in God's way. It's interesting that uh, there are hints of the truth of the Trinity in this very epistle. There's an obvious reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, an obvious reference here in this text to the Holy Spirit. But let us also remember that there is a reference to God the Father in verse 1 where Jude writes to those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ but when he says that we are preserved in Jesus Christ we mustn't just think of ourselves as being preserved in the manner of some jam in a jar passively preserved and kept no, no, these four things that I have directed your attention to, building, praying, keeping, looking, shows that uh, we are to be active as well as passive. In other words, not just being preserved, but persevering uh, in our most holy faith. And we pray aright in the Holy Spirit when we pray to God the Father, through God the Son, through the Lord Jesus Christ who is the one mediator between God and men 
Now that's a fundamental Christian truth, is it not? Because no prayer in the sight of God is valid unless we pray through the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ. After all, this links up with the first point of building, because we build upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We build upon one who, as he taught us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, that he is our rock, the rock that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We dare not rest on or build upon the sand of human wisdom or the sand of human rulers. There are too many who are trusting in the Pope in these days, too many who suffer um, too much adulation for some celebrity evangelist. No, no, we must build upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our foundation, his finished work upon the cross, based upon his own unique person, his own deity. Uh, we truly pray aright when we come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And therefore, if we have that living faith, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, then we will pray aright. And this is essential and fundamental. So those who do pray, those who do uh, enjoy the Holy Spirit's presence and influence in our lives, are those who make much of Jesus. Not those who are always talking about the Holy Spirit, but those who are talking a lot about the Lord Jesus. Because our Saviour said that the work of the Holy Spirit was to testify of him. So where is Jesus in your estimate, in your devotions, in your aspirations, uh, in your ambitions? The Lord Jesus should be our foundation. She, he should be at the centre. So yes, we pray to God the Father, through God the Son, with the life and the power and the enabling and the faith through God the Holy Spirit. So that is so vital. Which leads us on to the third thing, keeping keeping you'll notice that um, Jude says here in verse 21 that we must keep ourselves in the love of God keep ourselves in the love of God now that's, that's a very interesting statement because we know do we not from Peter's first letter that he says that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation in other words it's God who keeps us and indeed we're told in verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling. So what is Jude saying? What does he mean when he says that we must keep ourselves in the love of God? Well, notice again there's an emphasis not merely on preservation, but perseverance. There is something that we must do. And in this case, we must keep ourselves in the love of God, which means what? It means, really, that we must keep close to God through the means of grace. Use the means of grace. Not only believe in grace, but use the means of grace. Which does, of course, mean reading the Bible. It means prayer. It means worship. It means self-examination. It means all these things, all the aspects of the spiritual life as a Christian. And we're to keep close to God, to keep ourselves in the love of God, which I believe uh, entails uh, two important things as well, that we are to see the love of God as the fountain of all our blessings, because our salvation is all of his grace. It's all about receiving rather than achieving. It's about God's mercy, not our merit. And therefore, we must keep ourselves in the center of the love of God. Remember that the Savior who came into the world to save us is the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, as Paul makes plain in Galatians 2, verse, verse 20. So we are therefore to uh, keep close to the love of God and to remember that it is because of his wondrous love that we're Christians at all. It's because of his wondrous love that we have a message of hope for this unlovely and unloving world. But also, it also means this, that as we keep close to the love of God, we ourselves will love him. 
and that is again uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. It links up therefore with the previous point that we should be praying because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the warmer we are in our love for God the closer we are going to be to his will and purpose for our lives. And since this holy faith which is intended to promote holiness within us is what it is, a holy faith we may be sure that uh, the more we love God the more we will hate sin the more we love Jesus the less we shall love sin and it's our affections which are so often of the problem if we grow cold in the Christian life if we grow warm towards the world then we're going to have problems sin and temptation will exert a baleful influence upon our spirits so it's so important therefore to, to keep ourselves in the love of God which brings us to the fourth point looking we've considered building praying keeping and now looking looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life obviously fundamental uh, to this thought is that we must be looking unto Jesus look to him it's uh, an illustration of faith isn't it the question is where do we direct our eyes our eyes can create problems can't they we can look at things which are not good for us to look at and even more importantly our spiritual eyes where our spirits focus upon what we delight in most of all we are to look to the Lord Jesus Christ as we read in Hebrews 12 we are to run the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus it's an expression of faith of total trust in him of total distrust of ourselves we look to Jesus for our salvation we look to him to grant us pardon daily pardon of all our sins we look to him for strength we look to him for peace, we look for him for direction, we look to him for everything because he is our all-sufficient Saviour. So we must be looking to Jesus constantly. But in particular, we're told that we are to be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Yes, we are to look to him who is our merciful Saviour. But there's another point which I believe is very important because when we're exhorted to contend earnestly for the faith it's all too easy to contend with a carnal zeal with a merely human zeal. And when we're contending for the faith in an ungodly world and very often against ungodliness in the church this is means that we're going to have to be zealous, we're going to have to say things which are unpopular, we're going to have to say things with conviction, and we run the risk of being dismissed as being judgmental, because people like to have their own opinions unchallenged. But um, no Bible-believing Christian can uh, live in those terms. No, no. We are to contend earnestly for the faith. We must be like Martin Luther. Um, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me, amen. Yes, we must stand up and be counted. Stand up for Jesus, as the, as the hymn puts it. But we must be very, very careful to, make, to be sure that our zeal is driven not by our own um, pride and our own arrogance, we certainly mustn't give the impression of being Pharisees when we stand for truth against those who have corrupted truth. They like to cause convinced and convicted Christians as Pharisees. No, no, we trust in the mercy of God, not in our own self-righteousness. So to be accused of Pharisees is really a, a perverted uh, definition of the word. No, we, we rest upon the mercy of God. But looking to the mercy of God constantly 
in the convictions that we express and the way we express them, uh, we're really avoiding the kind of pitfalls that we could be accused of and which could intimidate us and make us too silent when we should um, speak up. And we look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Because this is the message which leads to salvation. Everlasting life. Because the people whom we're warned against, yes, those who, like Muslims, deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, and this encompasses every other cult or religion or ideology uh, which uh, which does this we must realize that such people who deny the gospel it is a gospel of death eternal death those who corrupt the gospel who believe as Jude has pointed out to these wicked people those who profess the grace of God but live wickedly they too will end in eternal death so all that we are contending for all that we are building upon all that we are resting in, the Saviour in whom we trust. Ours is the gospel, the good news, which leads to eternal life. So they are the four things that Jude is saying, that we will contend aright for our most holy faith, for our holy Saviour, and for the holy life that he calls us to in the Christian life. But this will not be easy, not by any means. And that's why we need the final two verses of the epistle, where we read, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and for ever. Amen. Why does Jew speak in, the, in these terms? Well, because contending for the faith is going to be a costly thing. It's going to be a demanding thing. The problem is that I think there are too many Christians these days we keep within our cosy, complacent, cowardly comfort zone. That's not the Christian life according to the Bible. And why not? Well, because Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. In other words, um, too often the world has an excuse to deny our faith when they don't see much transforming evidence uh, in the life of those who profess it. So it's going to be demanding, it's going to be challenging. So he ends up, therefore, with some encouragement. Because we are inclined to stumble, to fall. Sometimes we can fall into the very sins that are condemned in this epistle and many others besides. But we need to be encouraged to know that the one in whom we trust is able to keep us from falling. He's able to keep us from stumbling. He is able where we are unable. So when we fall, let's turn to him again for renewed forgiveness for the renewed strength of his spirit. He is the one who aids us because he is able to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We are full of faults, but he is able to present us faultless at the last, and that of course is the destiny of our transformed lives, of being sinners who are now saints. And then the great comfort to know that despite all the ups and the downs, the tossings and the turnings of our troubles uh, and the trials of our Christian life, not only is our Saviour able, not only does he aid, but he also accomplishes the completeness of our salvation. That's what he says. He's able to present us before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Saviour who alone is wise. There's a strong affirmation of the deity of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He alone is wise. 
We are foolish by nature, so we need his wisdom. But also, he is the one who will receive all the glory, and we will receive all the blessing. That is the great encouragement. So let us contend earnestly for the faith. Let us not be shrinking violets in the garden of the Lord, but seek to stand up and be counted for his glory and for the blessing of the world. And to him be all the glory and the majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Now what a succinct conclusion to the letter. Amen. We agree. So be it. And it shall be. So I hope you all agree that as we contend earnestly for the faith, this holy faith, let us seek to be building, to be praying, to be keeping and to be looking to him who loved us and gave himself for us who saves us by his blood who sanctifies us by his spirit and who will bring us to the glory everlasting may that be your experience and mine Amen <laughs>